you're singing. So I, I'm wearing short sleeves today because I'm, I'm just hoping that I can bring back the last two days okay, of, of weather. Okay, sorry for those of you that don't like sun. Okay, I tend to like sun, so um, just had to throw that in there. If you have your Bibles, turn to Psalm 103. Okay, and I'm going to do something that I don't, normal, that I don't normally do, uh, but I'm going to ask you to stand as I read God's Word this morning. Psalm 103. I read this in our prayer time. We, we, by the way, just so as a reminder, we pray before the service. We gather at 845 and spend a few moments praying for our morning. Uh, and so I want to encourage you to, to come if that's something you would uh, be interested in. You can join us every Sunday morning at 845. But I just want to uh, open up by helping us focus on where we're going to go this morning as we look at our final encounter in our series. Psalm 103. Praise the Lord my soul. All my inmost being praise His holy name. Praise the Lord my soul and forget not all His benefits. Who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. Who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. Who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As the Father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are but dust. Would you pray with me? God, we just thank you so much for your love and your compassion. Lord, whether we seek it, think we deserve it, don't acknowledge that we need it. Lord, every day you shower us with love and mercy and compassion. Lord, I'm so thankful for that, God, that we don't get what we deserve. Lord, but we get love from you, our creator. God, now as we dive into your word, as we look at an encounter of Jesus as he walked on this earth, God, just open up our our hearts, our minds to what you have to teach us this morning. Lord, we love you. We pray all these sayings in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, go ahead and find a seat. Well, good morning, Calvary Parkside. If uh, you're watching online or you're visiting this morning, my name is uh, Doug Boyd. I have the privilege of being lead pastor here at Calvary Parkside. Excited to have you attending with us this morning. We're concluding a series that we started, man, I don't know, back in like March. Okay, it's been a while that we've been uh, in this series called Close Encounters or Encounters with Jesus. As we've looked at individuals that Jesus uh, happened upon, uh, either uh, through circumstance or they saw him out, but he encountered them. And through that encounter, their lives were forever changed and in some cases turned upside down okay, for the good. And so if, if your Bibles are still out, go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 7. That's where we're going to be this morning, Luke 7. And as you turn there, you know, it's one of those stories and, that makes me wonder, okay, what, you know, why, why did some gospel writers why did Matthew choose to include stories that John left out okay why did Mark include stories that Matthew left out you know why what what you know you know the writers they had to be very selective in what they wrote right I have to wonder why they chose the stories that they did but John tells us in in his gospel that if if they were to record everything if Matthew Mark Luke and John recorded all the events of the life of Jesus that I'm not sure it would be a big enough book to contain it all, right? So again, they had to be selective. And this morning is one of those stories that Luke is the only one that tells it. And even then I wonder why. Because it's a short story. 
It's a, it, it's seemingly a nondescript story. It's kind of, it's, it's one of those, it's a drive-by miracle. Okay, I'll call it that, where he just kind of, he, Jesus swoops in, performs a miracle, and just kind of keeps on going. It's like he barely stops. So, in a situation like that, what, what can we learn? Well, first and foremost, I think something we can learn is just because a story is short, just because an encounter is brief, just because it happens in a nondescript village doesn't make it any less impactful, doesn't make it any less important. And so let's read this story from Luke 7 of Jesus' encounter with a widow. We'll read the whole story, then we'll go back and unpack it. Verse 11, soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her, and when the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her. He said, don't cry. Then he went up and touched the buyer they were carrying him on, and the bearer stood still, and he said, young man, I say to you, get up. And the dead man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. And they were all filled with awe and praised God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. And this news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. Okay, this story right here is is one of only three stories in the Gospels that, that is recorded where Jesus raised someone from the dead. Right? This story and only two other times that we know of, Jesus performed what is, in my mind, is the most miraculous of his miracles. There's the most famous story of which uh, most of us are familiar with when he raised Lazarus from the dead. And oddly enough, like the story we just read, John is the only one to record that one, right? So John records Lazarus, Luke recorded this one. And then the other one we actually looked at as we started off this series where Jesus uh, raises Jairus' da- Jairus's daughter, from the dead. That one is actually recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So again, these are, these are miracles that only certain gospel writers latched on to. And some are brief, some are long, but again, they're not any less impactful. And Jesus did this, perform this particular miracle, I believe, okay, to show his power over death, which we'll talk a little bit more later. So let's go back. Let me go back now that we kind of, uh, that we've read it and we, we kind of know where we're going. Let me just kind of break this story down for us. And in the end, I want to share three truths for us to take away. Three truths that we can apply even in a story as brief as this one. So back to verse 11 here in Luke 7. Soon afterward, okay, soon afterward, soon after what? Well, just prior to this story, Jesus was in Capernaum, his adopted hometown, and it was there where he healed, or he brought back, he healed a, uh, the servant of a Roman centurion, who oddly enough was near death, had not died, but was near death. And so now he's traveled 25 miles, right? He, he heals the centurion's servant, brings him back to health, and then goes on a 25-mile trek southwest to a little village called Nain. In fact, I did some research. Uh, Nain actually still exists. It's a little Arab village, has about 200 people in it, and there's no archaeological evidence to show that it's, it's any different. It was any different back then, right? About 200 people. So again, very small, very nondescript village for Jews to perform one of his most magnificent, or if not the most magnificent miracle, which triggered in my mind another little nondescript village where a miracle was performed. That's the birth of Jesus, right, in Bethlehem. So it is interesting to think about those two bookends, right, the birth of Jesus, miracle of all miracles. And now we have this miracle taking place in another nondescript village called Nain. So soon afterward, after Jesus had uh, healed the centurion's servant, walked 25 miles, so he's got a crowd with him, and he comes to a town called Nain, and his disciples and the large crowd went along with him, which 
again, just amazes me. Think about this. Don't, don't let these minor details just, you know, skip by you. Just in one ear and out the other. That this crowd, a crowd of people who really didn't know who Jesus was, walked 25 miles with him. Not knowing what's going to happen next. Okay? I, I could ask for a show of hands. Is there anyone that you would walk 25 miles with that you didn't really know very well? Huh? Uh, no? Okay? I'm not following you 25 miles unless I know I'm getting something for that. Right? But they're, they're going to walk for 25 miles with Jesus wondering what's next. Right? Hoping to see something incredible. Right, and so they, as they approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. Hey, think about this for a second. Think about the collision of these two crowds, the contrast of these two crowds. You've got the Jesus crowd, right, the excited crowd, they're, they're, they're pumped, they're like, oh, something cool is going to happen because he just healed a centurion's son, and so something cool is going to happen now, and so they're all excited about what's going to happen, and then... They encounter, they collide with a crowd in mourning. So you have a celebratory crowd and a crowd in mourning. And they collide with Jesus in the middle. And don't miss, don't miss the detail that Luke provides us. right? That this is the only son of his mother and she's a widow. That's important for us to understand. Because in the first century, as a woman, you're only worth in the first century, was the man in your life, your husband or your son. In this case, she's a widow, her husband passed away, so now her only worth, her only means of support is through her son, and now he's gone. And so, realistically, she's out of options. She's in a drastic situation. She's in a precarious situation because she's got no one to support her financially, She's got no one to support her, uh, support her emotionally, socially, right? She can't get a job. I mean, she, there's nothing she can do. Okay, so don't miss that detail. And so she encounters Jesus, or better yet, Jesus encounters her. Verse 13, and when the Lord saw her, when the Lord saw her, saw her in her grief, saw her in her sorrow, in the midst of her mourning, when he saw her, saw her in her hopelessness. He responded in a moment of grief and loss and hopelessness. In my mind, the only way the Son of God could respond, look what it says, his heart went out to her. His heart broke for someone he didn't even know for someone who wasn't seeking him out right she was going to walk right by him we don't know that luke doesn't tell us whether or not she knew of jesus or she had heard of jesus but really in this case jesus doesn't matter because she's lost her son she's lost the only lifeline she had left and so she's going to walk right by jesus and jesus stops Stops her, stops the crowd. And in that moment, his heart of compassion pours out on her. And he said, don't cry. Don't cry. And then verse 14. And then he went up and he touched the buyer they were carrying him on. And the bearer stood still. Now, just so we have some context of what a buyer is, I have a picture up here. I think we're going to get up on the screen of what a buyer is. It's basically, basically a stretcher. Okay, so they're carrying this son on a stretcher to go out, and you have to go outside the city to be buried, right, as was the custom. He couldn't be buried inside the city, so he buried outside the city. He's covered, right, and he is not to be touched, right, because if you touch a dead body, you, you run the risk of be, becoming unclean right, spiritually, religiously speaking. But what does Jesus do? He goes right up. He walks right past the mother. He walks right through the crowd of mourners, walks up to the stretcher, 
and he touches death. The giver of life in this moment touches death because he knew. He knew that there's life beyond the son that was laying there. So as he said, he, he says, young man, I say to you, get up. And the dead man sat up and began to talk. I love that. Okay. He gets up and just starts jabbering away, right? And we don't know what he's talking about, but he's just jabbering. I don't know about you, but when I get up in the morning, if I, out of a deep sleep, the last thing I want to do is start having a conversation. It's like, wait, oh, get some coffee, or in my case, a Dr. Pepper. Okay, well, I, but I, I need to get some caffeine before I start talking. He's just, man, he's just, he's just talking away. And Jesus then gave him, listen, this, he gave him back to his mother. In this moment, Jesus met a material need. Right? He, he, it doesn't say he forgave him of his sins or he, you know, he talked about the kingdom of God. I'm going to die for your sin. No, he basically, in this moment, met the material needs of a widow. He, he raised the son from the dead and said, go back to mom. Go home to your mother. Okay, you got a job to do. Your job's not done yet. Your job is to take care of your mom. And, he's, and he sends them on their way. And then verse 16, they were all filled with awe. That's this crowd, all of a sudden, remember, two crowds, two different crowds with two, in two different emotional states. Celebratory crowd, mourning crowd. Okay, crying crowd, hopeless crowd. All of a sudden in that moment, they were all filled, all of them were filled with awe and praised God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. It's amazing to me as I, as I, as I read that. And all they've seen Especially the, 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 the crowd that had been following him for 25 miles, right? They had seen the centurion's servant healed. And now they've seen the dead raised, the dead brought back to life. And still, they don't get it, right? Still, they, rec- they only recognize Jesus as a great prophet who has appeared among us, right? Not the Son of God, not Messiah, not giver of life. But simply a great prophet has appeared among us. And God has come to help his people. They still don't get it. They lack understanding. But don't let that overshadow. Verse 17. The news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding community. This, was, this miracle served as a launching pad for the spread of of Jesus for the spread of the kingdom of heaven for the spread of his message about going to a cross and dying for the sins right of the world because that's what should happen that's what should happen when you and I encounter Jesus when we have a moment that we can only describe as miraculous, when Jesus shows up in a a way like that, our only response should be to go tell everybody. Right? Anybody. We give awe, we give, uh, we're awed by what God did, we praise God, and then we go tell. Right? So don't, hear that order. First we praise God, we give glory where glory is due, right? Then we Go. And we spread the news. Now what we did last week is we, we started down this path of allowing, inviting people in our church family to come and to share an encounter. To give glory to God and to share their story of how they encountered Jesus. And so we're going to continue that this morning. So I'm going to invite Caleb um, to come up and to share his story of a Jesus encounter.
My name's Caleb. Can, can everyone hear me all right? <laughs> all right. So I, I, have, I don't have a ton of experience getting up in front of you guys, so please extend some grace. That'd be great. Um, I kind of want to start, start out kind of like Pat did last week. You know, um, kinda, I grew up in the church. My, my parents were devout Christians in, you know, North Carolina in the South, and I gave my life to Christ when I was about five years old. Um, I'd always, like, struggled with the intangibility of Christ. That was my biggest point where how can I believe in something that I can't see or hear or physically touch at times. When I was 14, my father, my biological father, uh, left my family which really sent my relationship with Christ kind of in a downward spiral because the, the pain of that warped my ability to see God. I, I had renounced my faith at that point because I was looking at God through the same eyes that I saw my own father through, through pain of the abandonment and, you know, and having the experience of praying for my family not to fall apart and it happening anyway. When I was 15, I went on a youth, some, like a summer trip with, a, with my youth group at the time to like a little campground outside of uh, Portland. I felt like I was drifting through this world with no one to guide me. And the pain that I was feeling was just constant. And I'm not gonna look at the script. <laughs> um, the pain that I was feeling was constant. I didn't feel like I had a guide and I didn't feel like I had a purpose in this world. And so while everyone was really distracted with, uh, I believe it was a worship session, everyone was in the trap chapel of this big house we had, you know, rented out for the weekend. And so I, there was this upper balcony, and I had walked out to the balcony. I was walking, I was looking out over the hills. So it was beautiful, you know, these beautiful rolling hills. And I was watching the sunset, and I had a plan to not wake up that morning. I had a plan just to, you know, call it quits. I was done with the pain. I was done with not understanding why I couldn't understand God, basically. And a youth leader stopped me just a few moments before I would have gone through with it. And he asked me why. He's like, why do you want to end your story here? And I explained my story. I explained my pain. And he shared with me a very similar story where his father did the same thing to him and, it, and showed me um, a uh, dent in his forehead where his father hit him with a hammer. And um, he took my ability to hurt myself away from, my, from me and gave me um, this Bible verse that you've probably seen me with. It's uh, Deuteronomy 31.6. And it says, Do not be afraid or terrified of them, for the Lord your God goes with you wherever you go. He will never leave nor abandon you, which was a really big influence in my life from that point forward. Uh, his name was John, is the guy who helped me. And in that moment, I had never felt closer to God because I had finally found some semblance of peace. And although it wasn't the end of my problems, and although it wasn't, a, it wasn't the day I gave my life to Christ, it would be a few years later that I eventually gave my life back to Christ, it was in that moment that kind of spurred me onward and I strive every day to get back to that, to get back to feeling like um, I'm closer to God. And, um, and that is my story. Thanks, Caleb, for sharing that. I loved what you said at the end where it's not the end of the story. Right? Our encounters with, with Jesus say it's, it's a daily thing. Right? Jesus shows up. In our, in our lowest moments when we're not sure where to turn, Jesus shows up. So I want to encourage all of us to, to keep looking. Keep looking for those moments uh, for Jesus to show up and to take away our pain, our fear, our doubt, our confusion. Allow him to be uh, your savior. So what, what can we take away from this encounter here in Luke 7, what can we take away from Caleb's t testimony? Because they really, they really, they go hand in hand in terms of, of today's takeaways. The first one is this, 
know that God is always on time. God is always on time. When Caleb, when he, when he was out on that, on that balcony, okay, thinking this is it, God was right on time. Sure, could God have, sh- could God have shown up sooner? Yeah, we can question that all day. We can always question, God, were you late or what were you think? Why? Okay. But know that God is always on time. I mean, in, in this story here in Luke 7, right, could, could he have gotten there quicker? Okay, we, could he, did he delay things? I mean, well, again, that's not, that's not for us to question. Just know that God is always on time. If I, if I think of the story of Lazarus, right? I mean, that, there's a story where you really could question what Jesus was thinking, right? Because this, this is a good friend of his that when he first got wind that Lazarus was sick and Lazarus was about to die, what did Jesus do? He hung out where he was for two days, basically waiting for Lazarus to die. I don't know about you, but if, if, if I were to get word that one of my friends or relatives is, is about to pass away, okay, am I just, you know, might say, ah, let me finish the basketball game, right? Let me, I, got a, I got an appointment tomorrow. I mean, no, you're, you're, your entire schedule is getting turned upside down, and you're getting on a plane, you're getting in a car, you're doing whatever you need to do to get there. Not Jesus. He, he waited, and Martha criticized him for it. If you know the story, Martha criticized him. Jesus, if, if you'd have been here sooner, right, Lazarus would not have died. Well, yeah, probably. But then why wait? Why wait? Why does God show up when you choose to show up? Why doesn't he show up sooner? Why doesn't he show up later? Why, why does he show up when he shows up? Because... He's God. And because he wants to be sure he gets all the glory. Right? And we can't chalk it up to coincidence or circumstance. So he waits until we're at our lowest moments. And then he shows up so that our faith will be strengthened. Psalm 27. The writer tells us something about this whole idea of waiting. Psalm 27, verse 13. So this says, I remain confident of this. Confident of what? Confidence that I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I'm confident. I don't know when God's going to show up. I don't know how God's going to show up. But I'm confident. And so because I'm confident that God's always on time, I wait. Right? I wait for the Lord. He says, be strong and take heart, but wait. He says it twice in case you missed it the first time. Wait. Be strong and wait. Because God's timing is perfect. Job, Job is another example of, of the whole hoping and waiting game. Right? I mean, Job, it's a story of an incredible amount of pain. I mean, this is a guy who went through an, you know, loss of family, loss of business, right? loss of health. He lost it all. And yet, he never wavered in his faith. He hoped and he waited. He hoped and he waited. So remember, God is always on time. He was on time for the widow. Right, just as she was leaving the city, just as she was about to bury her son, Jesus shows up and restores her faith, restores her happiness. He did the same thing for Caleb, and I'm sure you have stories as well as where God did that for you. The second thing we learn from this story is that God is compassionate toward us even when we don't ask, even when we don't ask for it or think we deserve it, God's compassionate. I mean, uh, most of these encounters, probably the majority of of these encounters that we've been 
looking at are about people that sought out Jesus, right? The woman who had been bleeding for 12 years sought him out. Jairus sought out Jesus. Uh, the, the, the friends with the paralytic, right? They sought out Jesus so much so that they tore a roof apart to get to Jesus, right? They, the leper crawled, cried out to Jesus, right? I mean, story after story is of people crying out, Jesus, Son of God, have mercy on me. Jesus, Son of God, save me. It, Jesus, I, I know it, it, you have the power to heal. Please heal me. I mean, time after time after time. We read of individuals that took time and energy to seek out Jesus. But know there are times, like this story right here, where Jesus is not approached. Right? He's not asked. They don't ask. This widow doesn't ask Jesus for anything. Again, she doesn't care in this moment. She's caught up in her grief. She's caught up in what's next. She's caught up in her sorrow. And in that moment, Jesus says, fine, I don't need you to ask because I know what you need. You don't need to ask because I know. And because I know, I'm going to show you unsolicited love and compassion. Why? Because it's who he is. I, I said earlier, Jesus reacted the only possible way he could with love and compassion as his heart, it says in verse 13, as his heart went out to her. I read it earlier, Psalm 103.8, the Lord is merciful, compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness. We also read in Lamentations chapter 3. We have it up on the screen. There we go. The Lord is... Uh, because of the Lord's great love, right? Because of his great love, we're not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They're new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. We can count on God. We can count on God even when we don't know it or want it or believe it. God's compassionate toward us even when we don't ask for it. But as great as those, two, those first two points are, right, that God's always on time and God's always compassionate, okay, the third one, don't miss it. Because what, what I think we can draw out of this story is this, that God offers a permanent resurrection from the dead for all who believe in him. You ever think about this? You ever think about the, this, this, this miracle of Jesus raising these people from the dead, these three individuals? Okay. As great as Jesus was and is, these were temporary. It, uh, this miracle actually wore off, if you think about it, in that sense. Right? Because each one of these, these three, Jairus' daughter, Lazarus, the widow's son, where are they now? They're still dead. Okay, they died. Even after Jesus rose them, they still died. It was a temporary miracle. But don't miss this, because in this temporary miracle, this widow was given a taste of what will happen one day. Right? He, she was given a taste of what it will be like when Jesus comes back and the dead are raised back to life. Because God offers a permanent resurrection. He offers us a permanent resurrection. Earlier I mentioned uh, that I believe that Jesus performed these, these, these specific miracles, raising people from the dead, to show his power over physical death. And then he went to the cross. And it was at the cross where he displayed his power over spiritual death. Right? He conquered spiritual death on the cross. John 10.10, 10, Jesus said this, Satan comes to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and life to the full. And he's not just referring to physical life. I believe he's also referring to our spiritual life. 
I mean, he said it to Martha in John 11. Right, when he said, I am the resurrection. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live. Right, even though they die. Oh, that was pretty good. Okay, they're brought back to life. Woo. I was worried there for a minute. That was permanent. Okay. Woo. Miracle. Okay. Okay. Even though right, Lazarus, Jairus' daughter, the widow's son, even though they died, they believed. I honestly believe this widow, even though Luke doesn't tell us, I have to believe that she recognized who raised her son. And because of that, she gained eternal life. So today, today wraps up, wraps up this series, Encounters with Jesus. And, and I think this, this series has given us an opportunity. In each of these stories, we've had the opportunity to experience the heart of God. A heart that cares, a heart that desires to provide relief from pain and fear. I mean, just think back to each story, right? There's care, there's compassion, there's actual healing, right? From, from pain, whether it's leprosy or blindness or paralysis, right? There's healing. So it's a heart that cares, a heart that provides relief, a heart that heals, but most importantly, a heart that forgives. A heart that forgives. That's why we have these encounters. That's, that's why we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We have these four Gospels. So that we can get a peek into the heart of God. That's the whole purpose behind this series. For us to be able to get a glimpse of God. John wrote it near the end of his gospel in John chapter 20. He writes this, he starts out with this, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples. I'd love to know what those were. Okay, this is what I'm curious. I wanna, when I get to heaven, you, know, you have those, that list of questions you're going to ask. I want to know what miracles I missed out on. Okay. Did you raise anybody else from the dead? Okay. Did, you know, well, what else happened? He performed many other signs which are not recorded, but these are written. Okay, all this, what you, we have written down here is enough. Okay, now we can argue, hey, they just found something new, you know, new scroll, new whatever. I'm not here to debate the validity of whatever's been found. Okay, or this book versus that book being included. I just take, I, I'm pretty literal, so when John says, okay, these right here, it's enough for you to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life. That's why we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's why we have encounters with Jesus. Caleb encountered Jesus on a balcony. Why? So he could believe you have evidence that Jesus is who he says he is and that, that Jesus will do what he promises to do. And again, I'm, I know there's others out, of you out there that have the same story. The same story of an encounter with Jesus. And we're going to continue to hear more and more stories from our church family. But having spent a couple months going through these encounters I want to close with this. All of us have an opportunity to take hold of these stories, take hold of these encounters in the Bible and our own encounters, and to respond. To respond. To like the crowd responded. To first give glory to God. And then... To tell others that he is, in fact, the Son of God. So here's the question. Not knowing where you are, those who watch online, not knowing where you are in your spiritual journey. Here's the question. 
Three of them. First of all, have you, have you believed that Jesus is the Son of God? Have you accepted him as your Lord and Savior? If you haven't, great, great day to do it. Now would be a great day to accept Jesus as your Savior. And I'd love to talk with you more about that. So have you accepted him? Secondly, do you believe? Currently, are you in a state of belief or are you in a state of doubt? Because we all go through it. We all go through stages where we doubt, we question, we wonder, right? Moment of confusion. So where are you right now? Where are you right now in your belief? Are you in a, are you in a state of doubt or confusion or are you in a state of, yeah, I'm, I'm there, right? If you're currently finding yourself uh, uncertain, wondering what God's up to, thinking maybe he's a little late. Remember I talked about he's always on time, but right now he's maybe a little late for you. Okay, well, I'd love to pray for you. Larry, Pastor Larry, could, we'd love to pray with you. So we'll be up here after the service okay, for a few minutes and we'd love to pray with you. Prayer and encouragement. And then finally, will you? Will you go and tell? Will you go and tell your, of your own Jesus encounter? An encounter that changed you. And allow others to see Jesus in and through you. Let's pray. God, we thank you. We thank you for the encounters that are recorded in the Bible, and we thank you for the encounters that are recorded on our hearts, that's recorded in our lives, that's recorded, in, in, uh, recorded through testimonies, God, of people that we know. Because it helps us. It encourages us. It strengthens our faith. It helps us wait on you for your perfect timing. God, we, again, we thank you for the compassion that we receive from you each and every day. And then finally, <laughs> above all, we can't thank you enough for eternal life that you made possible when you sent your son Jesus to come and die for our sins. God, we're so thankful for all of that. And so now, God, we just want to lift up our voices and give you honor and give you praise because of your son Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen.